All right, Kathy. Well, thanks again for being a guest on Wicked Smart Golf. Very excited to cover the mental game with you today. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I love talking about this topic, so I appreciate it. Absolutely. It was fun to uh, really binge your podcast. And I, I heard you on our uh, mutual friend Tori's podcast. And so knew knew that I had to have you on here because you have a really cool background, uh, not only as a player, you played very successfully as a junior, college, pro. Um, then you got into teaching the game and into the mental coaching. So you have like done it all. That's why I was like, man, she can provide a, a lot of value to our listeners. And uh, yeah, kind of wanted to to go back in time a little bit. Like when were you like, I love golf. I got to go all in on this. Was it something as a junior that was a no brainer for your future? Uh, no, not really. I had a, my dad was a golf pro. And so I wanted to hang out with my dad. And so I went to the golf course every day at 6am. So I could hang with my dad all day. And I just played golf. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. So our season was pretty short. So during that time, I just, you know, yeah, I went to the golf course, I spent every day that, you know, it was decent weather to as people joke, just the 4th of July, but there was more weather than that. Nice weather than that. And I just hung out at the golf course. And then I kind of accidentally got good at it. And I like being good at things. So I, I mean, when I say accidentally, it wasn't like it was a passion of mine. I loved playing with the guys who worked in the shop and I hung out, but you know, cause there weren't very many girls who played. And then it just seemed like, well, you're pretty good. You should probably go try and play for college. And then I made a college team and I did okay. Um, and I could have done better. That was like definitely the mental component at that time. But, um, they're like, well, you've come this far. You might as well turn pro. And so I went and played on the European tour and the South African tour in Australia. And I played and went through, played in lots of mini tours here in the States and went through tour school and all those things. And then, um, yeah. And so I did it. It wasn't, was, it wasn't a huge passion. I loved it, but I loved being around. I love being around the golf community. And I think a lot of that had to do with that. My dad was a golf pro. And then of course my brother's a golf pro. My husband's a golf pro. So it's like, we got a lot of golf pros in the family. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I want to, I want to have a family dinner with you guys. That, that sounds uh, like no, it's yeah. boring. It's like poor people, the poor people who are with us. It's like, it's like my dad is one of those guys that, you know, can remember like back in 1967 on hole number one, and he'll give you a play by play shot by shot. And my brother and I are like, we can't remember the holes and the shots that we hit last week, let alone, you know, that many years ago. So yeah, they can be kind of boring conversations. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Any, anytime you're talking about golf, that's pretty cool too, to have it all in the family like that. That's yeah. uh, that's a lot of fun because my, my yeah. family love them to death are not good golfers. So when I try and talk about, or they'll be out watching me and I'll hit a terrible shot. They're like, that was a good shot. I'd be like, no, it wasn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so the, yes. They're just out there supporting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what was that like traveling all over the the world too. I mean, that had to be that had to be fun. But obviously, I know that mini tour life is is really tough. What what were some of your experiences yeah. like? Well, the, yeah. Besides the mini tours I played here, then I played the European tour, which you know was their pr prime tour um, for women at the time. And, and it's um, so they're both different experiences playing overseas. Remember. I'm old enough to know when they, we didn't have cell phones. So I had to figure it out with maps and books and asking directions and learning some of the language in every country. It was a little, it's a little different, but you didn't know what you didn't know at that time. Mm -hmm. So I would never trade it for the world. I think what golf gave me as an experience, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to travel the world and see what I saw had it not been for the game of golf. I'm super grateful for that. But I will say that, uh, I remember one year I packed my suitcase two suitcases in January and I unpacked them in October and I was, I was exhausted. It was, it was a long year and I had that suitcase had been all over the world. Um, and I needed a break, <laughs> but yeah, it's you not, it's not easy. Didn't come home. I did not come home and I did not empty my suitcase. If I came home, I kept it packed because I wasn't home very long. Um, but you know, the thing is, is it's fun if you're playing well, it's not so fun if you're not playing well, if you're missing cuts and you're hanging around in another country over the weekend, waiting for the next to go to the next country. Um, it's hard and it's, it's, it's hard on your ego and your, um, you know, your happiness. So you've, you got to have a lot of, uh, mental skills in that department to keep yourself up. If you're not playing well, if you're playing well, it's super fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is the epitome of golf right there, whether yep. you're a professional or an AM. So <laughs> yep, um, for sure. at, what, at what point were you like, okay, this is the, the grind wore me down. Like I'm going to, I'm going to have to transition into something else. And it sounds like you got into teaching, but was there a, a tournament that you remember, or was it just kind of like, I need a break? It was money. 
it basically it boiled down to I did the math and I was spending more money than I could make as a woman at the time for sure that I would have had to finish probably in the top 25 to even make just like net out decent revenue. And it was like, this is, this is crazy. I I'm pretty smart, you know? So I was like, Oh, I could probably make some money. <laughs> I say that as I went into teaching, but um, I'm pretty smart. And, you know, I thought I could like make more money and maybe not having to travel so much. And then I met my husband and I, and I kind of then segued into teaching for the Nicholas Flick golf schools back in the day. And so, yeah, and I just jumped right into teaching. Awesome. What was, uh, what was like that? I mean, to be able to go, uh, from playing to the teaching side of things, like how, how was that? I feel like for me, I, I couldn't even give my girlfriend a lesson when we tried to go to the uh, simulator a couple of weeks ago. That is just like not how I'm wired. So was that a, an easy transition for you? Cause your dad was a, a golf pro or did that take some time too? No, I no. it was actually very challenging because you most golf pros know what they're doing, but they really don't know how to tell you what they're doing. So it's being able to put into words exactly what I would do to hit a chip or to hit a bunker shot. I just did it. You know, uh, my husband challenged me on that. He's like, well, tell me what you're doing with your chipping. I'm like, I just chip, you know, but tell me, you know, where is everything? Um, I think kids are better at it and younger people are better at it now, but at the time I just did it. And so being able to put it into words and then being able to say it as many t different ways as possible so that you could connect with the peoples, the golfers, um, more quickly is the skill of a good teacher. You know, someone who's able to not just say things one way, but to say them many different ways is a, um, is a really good teacher. The other thing that was really hard for me is I remember watching I, I used to think that, okay, this is not going to sound very nice. I have totally shifted from this, but I remember giving a lesson to a woman who couldn't hit it maybe, but 30 yards, 40 yards, 50 yards, something like that with her driver. And I used to, I looked at her like with a lot of empathy and almost pity. I was like, oh my gosh, this has to be so miserable. You know, I just came off playing for a living. I'm like, I don't know. How does she enjoy the game? I felt so bad for her. And she hit one drive that she got up, you know, in the air and it maybe went 60 yards. And I've never seen such joy on a person's face in my life. And I really had to pivot that that enjoying the game of golf isn't about hitting perfect and pretty little shots. You know, it's all relative for people. So I had to learn how to step into their shoes and understand that it's, you know, that um, you don't have to hit it as far as I do to enjoy the game and get pleasure out of the game or score what I score. And that was, I know that sounds kind of like, well, yeah, duh, but it was, you know, a lot of it was like, I, I used to just think people must be so miserable to miss hit the shot so many times, yeah, no, but I, she I was so happy. Either. Yeah. Isn't it funny? Yeah. She was probably happier than we've been sometimes when we're out there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, we're never satisfied. Right. And she was, I've never seen such joy in golf in my life. And I was like, you hit it 60 yards, you know, you can't like really just even carry like a small crick, you know? And she's like, Ew, this was the best shot ever. I was like, okay, like, this is cool. Like that you're bringing people joy. <laughs> that's a, that's a lesson for everyone listening to just, you got to enjoy it. Got to enjoy yeah. the good shots. Cause there's going to be so many bad ones and you're going to want to quit sometimes and you go through slumps, but yeah, you got to kind of remember why you got started and, and just like hitting yeah. good shots and how, how rewarding that really is. Uh, right. And, and we all kind of started there. Like we forget that we started there, right? Not everybody as short as she hit it, but yeah. So yeah, anyway. it's uh, it's just yeah, it's funny. Like you said, we're we're always just trying to get better, right? You you break a hundred, mm -hmm. then it's ninety, then it's eighty. It's just like a it's a drug. You're just like trying to chase the next high, trying to. Uh, it's yep. also expensive, like a drug too. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but man, <laughs> yes. it's good. It's, 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 it's good, <laughs> but it is legal and it's easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is expensive though. It adds up. That's for sure. Yeah. Especially that tour life. What, uh, yeah. what point were you like, you know, I'm, I'm finding success with the, uh, the coaching side of things, but got to start kind of incorporating the mental stuff because I think that that, that to me is like, there's this disconnect, right? You have people like us that try and work on the mental side and then you have the swing coaches and it sounds like you were trying to blend them together, uh, which is great because I feel like all but one coach I can think of has only been technical. And I've worked with probably 10 different people over 25 years. And when I really think about it, none of them talked about the mental game. So what point were you working with people and you're like, I got to start kind of injecting some of that mental stuff as well? So I injected a lot of mental 
stuff into my teaching, though I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just doing it from my standpoint, right? And the way that I see things. I worked on some things personally in my life. I got a life coach and I started really diving into this um, this podcast called Life Coach School. Basic, basically, I just dove all in and I started practicing what she was talking about on the podcast in my day-to-day life. And then I got a coach and then I started seeing some amazing shift and learned some skills that I decided to go and get certified. So I went through the whole process of getting certified. I coach people on any aspect of life. And I really, it wasn't even thinking about golf until I I was went for a, a walk. My big thing that I talk about in my podcast all the time is that I struggled with my putting. You know, I had some horrible thoughts about it. I've been to some very famous sports psychologists when I was playing and no one, you know, they just helped me with a routine um, mm-hmm. or, or a drill or something, which was useful, but it didn't actually help me with how I beat the crap out of myself after a bad round. It didn't help me with the pressure I put on myself to putt. It didn't help me with um, how to get over that feeling of disappointment and shame that I was occurring while I was playing golf for a living. And I found that through this avenue that I was talking about. And I remember walking going, I wonder if I could apply this to golf. And I did, it wasn't even a thing. I was helping people in a different way and I just put it into the context and I, I guinea pigged on myself because you can use any topic. Like I can coach people on anything using the kind of the formula that I use as, as far as managing your mind. And I turned my putting around in 10 days. That's not me playing every day either. Turned my putting around in 10 days where people were saying, what did you do? Did you switch your putter? Did you change your stroke? And all I did was change a thought. And that was really what it was about. And when I realized this, if I had had this when I was playing for a living, I would not have been sitting in my hotel room, you know, kind of like sulking over missing a cut. I would have made more cuts. I would have had more fun. I would have made more putts. I would have shot lower scores, but I didn't have it. And I decided that I was going to dive all in and, and change what, how I helped people from helping them with their swings and their grips and their posture and their aim to helping them manage their minds and to play to their potential and take the talent that they have at that given moment in time out onto the golf course. So it, it shifted because I saw the results in myself, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. I saw the results in myself over something that I struggled with for 30 years, my whole life. Um, and I thought it was just something that I was, it was just, I was destined to have this struggle. I quit golf, actually, because I was like, golf's no fun if you can't make putts. So I, I was, while I was raising kids, I used it as an opportunity just to quit. And Um, I mean, I played with students, I played in scrambles and stuff like that, but I really wasn't out there playing and definitely wasn't having fun. So that's how I transitioned is because I saw the, I saw the impact of the way that I coach on my personal life on the things that I actually went seeking it for. And then I applied it to golf and I, I shifted everything really quickly in 10 days. And then I just decided that's where I'm, that's how I, I can make a bigger impact on people's lives doing this. That's, that's amazing. I, I bet you still remember being on the putting green and being like, is this, is this really happening? Like, uh, yeah, it was, you don't yeah. trust it. I was like, wait a minute, am I, is this real? And so then I kept t- <laughs> testing it. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Isn't it funny how putting too, I, I guess not funny, but I, cause I've been there as well. I've, I've thrown a few putters in my day, but uh, <laughs> it, it's crazy how putting is so mental. It is so yeah. little to, I mean, yeah, sweet. I mean, you can just putt so many ways. You look at Jack versus Tiger versus Annika versus whoever. I mean, there's really no one way to do it. It's just so much up here. And so if you can figure that out there, I'm sure you started to apply that then to the short game and to the full swing. Yeah. And I really like in a lot of your podcasts in that episode I listened to you on with our friend Tori, you just talk about the one, the one brain, right? We have one brain, whether you're on the golf course or off the golf course. So can you kind of expand upon that? Cause I really like that concept and feel like a lot of people are, are really separating golf and life when it seems like there is a lot of uh, carryover, obviously. Yeah, well, we do have one brain, right? How we process disappointment doesn't matter if we disappointed off the golf course or on the golf course, how we process anger, how we manage our thoughts, how we think intentionally on purpose, whether we believe in ourselves before we see results on or off the golf course, it doesn't matter. And I think a huge component of where I struggled because I had a brother who played on the tour, like right out of college for his whole life. And I was like, why can he do it? And I can't do it. Like, what's wrong? Is it because I'm a woman? Is it because it's an eight? Is there something wrong with me that I don't have this golf brain. This, And that's why I don't like to call it mental game because I don't think it's a game. It's just your brain. It's golf. It's golf is like your, your, um, the way you, your mental golf is just how you manage your brain on the golf course, right? That's all it is. And, and you're doing the same things off of the golf course. 
The problem is, is that off of the golf course, we have time to avoid it. We have time we can buffer over it, which means we can eat, we can have ice cream, we can drink. Not that you can't drink on the golf course. We can go to and watch TV and get on our phones and we can just, we can hide in our room. We can do so many different things to avoid emotions or to not deal with things. You're stuck with it for four hours with the group that you're playing with in a container and you're, it, it reveals, golf reveals yourself to yourself when you're out there playing. You can't avoid it. And the way that it shows up is in the results that you create. So the, you know, being able to manage your mind is a life skill and doing it on the golf course is just that life skill on speed is all it is. Cause you, you got to do it before you hit the next shot. And when you can learn the skill, when I work with clients, I encourage them like, you have to practice it off the golf course. You know, in the off season, this is your time to practice it. This is your time. Don't wait until you tee up and then try and figure out how to manage your mind. If you're screaming at people in the car and you're angry for 15 minutes while you're stuck in traffic, learn how to manage that right now because you're going to take that onto the golf course. You're going to wonder why you're pissed off on the golf course. It's because you're pissed off screaming at people in the car, right? And so... The same thing is, is if we're people pleasers, if you're a people pleaser off the golf course, you're a people pleaser on the golf course. If you're a perfectionist off the course, you're, it's, it's not like it goes away when you go on the golf course, right? If we have anxiety that we don't, aren't very good at dealing with, it's going to happen out there. If we have chronic negativity, it's going to happen. If we're worried about what other people think off the course, we're going to definitely worry about what people think on, on the golf course. People tell me sometimes like, no, I only do it on the course. I'm like, well, why? Then, I mean, if you know how not to do it, then why the heck would you volunteer to just do it on the course? I'm saying you're just not being intentional about it when you're off the golf course. So conversely, as I'm rambling on here, people have skills that they don't even recognize they have. There's, I, you know, I coach lawyers and doctors and successful CEOs and people who deal with even moms who deal with just so much pressure and stress and they're able to function at a high level and get, and get great results. They're able to mentally pivot and use that to their advantage where they can still think and perform. Figure out what you do well, because that's the same skill that you want to take out to the golf course. Figure out how to put it in the context of golf. And uh, a lot of people already have the skill that they need uh, to go out there and play to their potential. They just don't haven't really connected the two. Yeah, I really, that, that makes so much sense. And it's funny how we always try and divide it and just think yeah. this is just me on the golf course. This is, and yeah. um I look at when you gave that traffic example, that that's one where I used to just be saying some pretty horrible things to drivers and still find myself every once in a while. And that would correlate to some negative self-talk on the golf course and uh, outbursts and things like that. And so, yeah, I think that identifying who you are off is, is going to impact uh, who you are on the course. So when people start working with you, you probably don't even, do you even start with the golf course uh, or do you just kind of start with their uh, kind of overview with their life and, and figure out how that's translating? Yeah, usually it's, I, I talk about things on the golf course because that's where they come to see me. And usually like, so I, it's easy to give me an example. And so we work mm -hmm. through an example of something where that they're getting tripped up or they're getting in their own way. And I teach them a way to manage their mind, like a little formula that I have. It's called steer. I talk about it in my podcast and I have them start practicing that. And then I encourage them to practice it also off the course because the more, just use any example. Sometimes I have kids, so it's dealing with school or it might be someone, something at work or it could be just family. And, um, I teach them how to basically self coach. Is that it? So you're going to self coach on the course. You're going to self coach off the course. And the more that you practice it off of the course, then it's easier to notice our tendencies when we're on the course. And I, you know, the, what I talk about is in, in the simplest sense for one to play to their potential is two simple steps. It's the first step is figuring out what state that you perform your best in, not Arizona, Texas, or Florida. It's what state, like what, how do I feel when I play my best golf? And mostly when you can tap into a round that you just loved and you played really well. For most people, they're going to say, I was pretty calm, or they're going to say, I was pretty confident. And I call it the three C's. It's calm, certain, or confident are a synonym of that. There are other states that work like motivation and determination and hope. Those work. But if we really wanted to tap into one of them, it's one of the three C's. So you want to figure out what your preferred state is. And then, um, and then your second, the, your second step is to hit as many shots from there as possible. And it just becomes a project. So I have clients who have the inverse correlation between the higher that percentage of shots got, the lower their score went. 
And so when we start just getting paying attention, right, awareness is our first tool. Let's pay attention. Like where were, were you pissed when you swung? Were you have, feeling pressure? Were you stressed? What was it if you weren't calm, certain or confident? And then let's learn how to manage that. And then you start saying to yourself, you know, this is you come up to a shot, let's say, where because you've gone through some awareness exercises like this, you come up to a shot and you're, there's three groups, let's say, on the next tee box. And you're like, this is the part of the story where I start thinking too much. My it's part of my story where I start thinking too much. I start thinking about my score. I get a little ahead of myself and then I don't play so well going in. And but now I'm prepared. I know that about me and I have some things to do and say to myself. Um, and that's just it. It's about just getting more aware of our own personal tendencies and trying to hit as many shots from calm, certain and confident. Because when we're in one of those states, we can think clearly and we can swing freely. And if you can swing freely, you're going to be able to take the swings that you own, meaning the ones that you can do on the range out to the golf course. If we're not thinking clearly, like if we're under stress or pressure or we're angry, we don't think clearly. We're in the back part of our brain, right? And so then we make those AKA stupid mistakes. We don't, you know, we're like, why did I swing there? Why did I hit it over there? What was I thinking kind of thing? Or you start thinking about things that don't matter. And then when those emotions show up in our body, we're usually squeezing a little bit tighter. We might swing a little bit faster. We might come out of our posture or do some things that are our tendencies. That happens because there's extra tension in our body. We're not calm and relaxed. So our swing is trapped behind that emotion. And so the job is to get and move. It's not to not feel an emotion. You can have seven emotions on one hole. The goal is like, I'm, I'm pissed off. I got 60 seconds to be pissed off before I go back into being calm before I hit this next shot. That's your job. Learn how to do that and you're gonna be able to play to your potential. Yeah, that that is powerful. Do you do you have because I actually was, you know, writing down a few situations and I, I survey my audience quite a bit and, and ask, you know, what they're suffering with and struggling with. And it, it seemed one of the biggest ones is uh is just getting getting angry, right? And it's just getting overly emotional and it leads to a bad hole, a bad stretch of holes. So in that 60 seconds, what what should people be thinking about to try and get back to calm or uh, confident or, or whatever those th- uh, one of those three C's were? Okay, so f- frustration leads to anger, right? It usually starts as frustration, it leads to anger. And it comes from one of two main reasons. One is we have unmet expectations. So we have expectations that we're not meeting. And so I would always encourage people to first, let's get our expectations in check, because if your expectations are unrealistic, um, for instance, you can't hit but three drives on the range, but you go out and think you should hit every fairway, right? So that's an unrealistic expectation that a lot of people do. I had a client who was uh, a lawyer, so saying that only because super smart woman, and she would get so pissed off if she didn't hit a nine iron within 12 feet. Now, why nine iron, right? I don't know. I asked her why nine iron. She's like, I don't know, nine iron. Why 12 feet? I don't know. I'm like, that's better than a tour player, right? But she did, there was just an unrealistic expectation. Plus she was a seven handicap, right? So it's not like she was a, um, you know, a scratcher plus handicap golfer. So we want to make sure our expectations are in check. The other reason that we get super frustrated is that we have an injustice that was served. We were wronged in some way. Driving, this would be someone cut you off and slammed on the brakes, right? We would, uh, we, somebody pickpocketed you. That would be where we'd have an injustice. In golf, that would be a bad break that like should have bounced one way, bounced the other way and went in the water. Or we, you know, our ball plugged in the face of the bunker, right? Then we get frustrated. What we want to do then is, is start noticing, are we arguing with reality? Because anytime we argue with reality, we lose only every single time. So if you're arguing that your ball is buried in the face of a bunker, you can waste all the air you want arguing with it. Your ball's still buried in the freaking bunker. So you, it's your job then to stop arguing and pivot. So now the question is, what do I want to do about it? What do I want to think here? What's my next best move? You got to start asking yourself really powerful questions and your brain will look for powerful answers. But when it comes to processing any emotion, whether it's anger or anxiety or stress, the first thing to do is acknowledge that I'm, I'm, I'm pissed right now. And that's not a problem. You, there's tools that I can tell, you know, that you can do to process emotions, but you can also just negotiate with your brain and say, like, I'm going to bitch about this all I want when I finish 18 and go into the clubhouse. But right now, what do I need to do? And we got to learn that skill. The longer you're screaming at cars on the highway, chances are the longer you're going to be pissed off over a shot. 
right? So practice on the highway, practice when you're like going, okay, that guy just pissed me off. I'm going to give myself 60 seconds to move past it. This is a great skill you all can practice so that you can transfer it out to the golf course. Yeah. Well, I love, love both those points. It's, uh, specifically the expectation management too. Cause I have a whole chapter in my book about that. Cause I, when I really got into golf writing five, six years ago and, and started writing more and, and trying to get as good as I could and I ended up going to Q school and I, and I'm trying to like figure out, you know, what, what is good. And I start tracking my stats and, and doing all this stuff. And you start to realize all the great data that's on uh, the PGA tour and all these apps and stuff. And then you see that the average birdie putts like 30 feet when they hit a green and regulation, it's like, wait a sec, these guys are the best players on tour and they only hit it 289 versus 335 all the time. And mm-hmm. it just, it's funny because I always say the PGA tour is just a highlight reel and we're, we're just spoiled yes. and we're, and we're watching all these great shots, but we're not seeing the three putts, the missed uh, three footer and just all these boring shots. And I would like to see that just as much as the highlight reel, just to curb our expectations. Cause we're, we're, oh my going, gosh, like the blooper so reel for the tour, right? I'm calling it, I'm calling it the low light reel and I want it on yeah. ESPN eight. <laughs> yeah, ESPN Ocho. That would be so yep. good, right? But the best way for, for people to do that, which nobody wants to do real for the most part is go out and watch the guys who are barely making the cut and watch what they're doing, you know, cause they're still like, they're just having an off week. They're, you know, they're, they're playing on the tour, but watch the misses that they have. They're going to be totally different than people that are on TV. To your point is they're on TV because they're at the top of the board because they're having a great week. And so they're not missing a lot of shots. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I was anytime I play a practice round for a tournament and I just get paired up with random people and I, I'm always just observing and uh, and I'll see that sometimes too, you know, they'll hit a great shot and and they'll have maybe eight, 10 feet and then they'll miss it and they'll beat themselves up and talk about it. And I'll, and I, I don't mean it in like a sarcastic way, but I'm like, you know that the PJ Tour make rate from that's only fifty percent, and and mm-hmm. then they try and fight it, and like, but I'm like, right. just, you know, maybe you know, you're not going to make all those. Tiger's not going to make all those. Like, so, mm-hmm. and people sometimes take it the wrong way, I think. But a lot of, when people get it, they're like, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense because anytime you're trying to force it, and you like you said, you get disappointed, and that leads to anger and frustration. Uh, I just wish uh, people could carry around a, an expectation management card like, oh, uh, yep, I didn't hit every green and regulation. That's OK. No one does. Yeah. And the, and the thing, too, is that, you know, um, being able to see how getting frustrated over missing an eight footer that you can only let's say that. Let me back up. I tell my clients and, and anybody who's listening, do this. Um, go out to the range and hit 10 shots with each one of your clubs. If it's the putting green or short game area, go wherever it's appropriate for that club and hit 10 shots, 10, because it's easy math and just, and figure out you wear a snapshot of what your expectations are for this period of time. You can redo it in two weeks. You can redo it in a month. So for instance, if you went out and you hit drives between two imaginary flag sticks and you out of 10, you hit five in between the flag sticks, that was the width of a fairway then your expectation for the day, if you managed your mind really well, because typically on the range, we're pretty calm, certain and confident. We're relaxed. We're not like there. We don't have danger out there like water and out of bounds and people. So in scores, right? So if you managed your mind well, you can expect to hit 50% of the fairways, which is seven. So when you miss a fairway, then you're like, going, oh, yeah, I'm going to miss a fairway. I'm going to miss one out of every other fairway. I hope I don't miss it horribly on the ones that I miss. I mean, that's really, that's golf. You know, it's the same thing with putts and bunker shots. If you're, if you can only get out of the bunker five out of 10 times, I'm doing 50% again, but cause it's easy, but then, so then every other bunker shot, you should be able to get up and down, but we, we get in our own way when we sit there and get pissed off that we didn't get out of the bunker you know, we're, uh, or that we didn't hit every fairway. And if it, if it serves you, this is the question I always tell people, if it serves you to be pissed off, if it serves you and helps your game, knock yourself out. But if it doesn't serve you, then why are you doing it? I mean, it's as simple as that because we have the option to think whatever the heck we want. Why are you thinking that you should be better than you are? Yeah. I love it. Quit arguing against reality too. That was, that yep. was a fun one. I, I like that a lot. Cause I had yeah. a plug, plug bunker shot on the 18th hole in the last day of a tournament. And I, I had played so bad. I was kind of already defeated at that point. And I just kind of laughed. Yeah. I just like, yeah, go in there and hit right. it. 
Right. And that's a stat we don't know very well, like how many times we can get out of a plug bunker lie and predict the role <laughs> right. and how far it flies. Like, I mean, you know, same thing with the ball out in the rough. Like, you know, we get ticked off because we don't know how much grass is going to get between the ball and the club face or if we're going to get a flyer or a knuckleball. Like we, there's things that aren't predictable, but yet we get pissed off at the results. And it's it's about what's going to serve me best for my next self to swing mm-hmm. over the golf ball. And that's, um, you know, that's the job when we're out there is just the person who can do that the best is the person who's going to take the most talent out there. Love that. And I know you've played a ton of tournaments and you coach a ton of players that are obviously professionals and playing in the highest level tournaments. Why is tournament golf so much harder for the everyday golfer? Like what, what is it that makes these so much harder and, and what are some things that we can do? Cause I got a lot of people that are like, I would love to get into a men's league or a women's league or start doing status events, but I'm too nervous or, or I just don't think I'm good enough. What makes tournament golf so hard? We, we make it matter. I mean, that's, that's basically it. If you go out and play at a practice round, I coach people on this all the time. Uh, I play so well in my practice rounds or with my buddies, but then I go play in a tournament and like a different person shows up. So the question is why? And like, well, I'm nervous. Why? Well, because, because I don't want to play bad. Why? Right. Everything we do and don't do is based on how we get to feel, right? It's, it's about how you're going to treat yourself at 18. It's what's waiting for you when you turn in your scorecard from you. That is what makes it matter. So if the more that you're going to punish yourself at the end of the round, the more your score matters. Like most people aren't playing golf or like I play golf for a living. So my income mattered, right? So it's like, that's right. a whole different animal. Um, but it's, but when you're playing amateur golf or you're just playing in USGA events or you're trying to qualify, the bigger of a deal you make your result, the bigger of a deal you make it, whether you qualify or don't qualify, you freak your brain out. Your brain thinks it's a big saber toothed tiger and it's trying to protect you. So it puts you on high alert and you go into this fight or flight thing. And next thing you know, you can't think clearly. You're making stupid mistakes. You're all tense. Your tempo's off. You're wondering what happened to you. It's because your brain's like saying, we need to get in the cave and stay safe and go home and not put ourselves out here because at the end of 18, you might die. I mean, this is what we do to our brain. Like, you know, but when we sit there and say, it's not a tiger. Okay, brain, I'm okay. And I don't make my results mean anything about me. If you can have your own back at the end of 18, it's like we can want to achieve things, but we got to understand that the more that I need to achieve something to feel good, the less likely you are going to be able to achieve it. Yeah. I I had a coach one time say, you are not your score. And I think that that's yeah. one I've always enjoyed. Sometimes I need to remind myself as well. But yeah, because he's like, you can't, it's it's different. You know, you, just because you have a good day doesn't mean you can be in a good mood. You have a bad day, you can be in a bad mood. And and obviously tournament golf tends to tends to bring out higher scores sometimes and, and a lot of pressure. And one of the things too, I feel like I keep hearing a lot. And I, I've experienced this earlier on in my career is, is they're just, it's dealing with bad playing partners or worrying about the opinion of others. How, how can people kind of combat like dealing with strangers? Cause you know, a lot of times you go from playing with your friends or family and then all of a sudden you sign up for a tournament and now you're with totally random people. Some might be really good. And some might be really bad. Some might be assholes. There's a couple I can think of. Some might be great people. So it's like, what, what's your strategy for people that are trying to figure out like, how do, how do I deal with playing with new people and, and still play my own game? Okay, so there are assholes in the planet. There are assholes who play golf, right? There's people who cheat. There's people who play slow. There's people who are loud. There's like this is we're we're arguing with reality that these people exist. It's kind of it's kind of I'm going to go back to the car analogy. I had I had a dad who had road rage, so I use this analogy all the time. I'm like, why are you screaming at this guy? And for as long as you've been screaming at this guy, there's always guys on the road that cut you off. So it's it's futile, right? So one of the things is it's we're, why are we surprised that people drive stupid, like that cut in and out of traffic, that cut us off, that tailgate, that do all the things that put us at risk? And every day we're surprised that they show up. Like we, we, we try and teach everybody a lesson out there. So same thing with golf. We shouldn't be surprised that there are assholes that we have to deal with. Our job is to then stay and not the the job is to not have the sentence. If they weren't doing this, I would be able to think clearly and I'd be able to focus and I'd be able to, um, you know, swing and, and enjoy my round. If they weren't chewing gum, if they weren't smoking in the cart, playing music, if they weren't, you know, playing slowly, I could manage my mind. 
right? So we have these rules, I call it a rule book that we have for people. And basically, you could stand on the first tee and you can go like, listen, okay, this is what I need you to do. Okay, everybody, everybody listening, I need you to say no more than seven words a minute. Any more than seven words, I get a little anxious, right? If you walk ahead of me, it's going to piss me off. I don't want to be pissed off today. If you play too slow, I'm going to be annoyed. So I need you to keep up the pace of play. I'm going to give you this many shots per minute. Like if we have this rule, right, we go through all the rules that we might possibly have. Then we can say that if you all do that, then I can have a quiet brain and manage my mind. Is everybody good with that? Right. And the people will go like F off, like, because I have my own rules too, like what I think is right and how I can manage my mind. So when we can give people, when w- the, the problem isn't that people do the things, the problem is, is that we wish they didn't so that we could manage our mind. And so the skill is to learn to manage your mind. And then you could bring on the assholes. I can play with the assholes, bring on the people who I can like, it's like not a problem. I can, do I want to do it? Maybe not, but I can, I can manage my mind around that right? Worrying about what other people think, right, is basically is, is what I would encourage people to do is to project into their heads what you think they think, what you think they're thinking. Okay. Right. When we worry about what people are thinking, let's say I'm worried they think I'm going to suck. It's the reason that you think they're, they're going to think that you suck is because you think you suck, right? They're, it's going to reveal to you your thoughts about yourself, you'd probably don't project into other people's brains. I'm wondering if they think I look too good in these pants. Like, I'm wondering if they think that my swing is too nice. Like, we're not worried about that, right? Because, well, we might be, but it's usually because it's not a thought that we have in our head. So we don't project it into other people's heads, right? But we project into their heads the things that we worry about is are the thoughts that we say about ourselves. That's why they're there. So your work is to clean up those thoughts. Start changing the dialogue about yourself because the better your dialogue is about yourself, the less you worry about what other people are thinking because it doesn't matter. I like that. Yeah, that's that's good. Just kind of flip that. And uh, yeah, I feel like, is that probably one of those things too, where you feel like if you're worried about what people think about you on the golf course, you're probably worried about that in your personal life. A hundred percent. Like, why would you, like, if you're not, you worry about what other people think off the golf course too. Like, why would you just go to the golf course and start worrying about it? Because you know, because you would have exactly what I just said. You'd have that attitude about what people think about you off of the golf course. Um, you'd carry that on to the course, right? But what, if we're, if it's really comes from a little bit of a, of an insecurity, like about, it's just a dialogue about ourselves, what other people think. Now we fight against our own natural tendency to want to be uh, included and liked. We don't want to be rejected. We're, we're really tribal in nature. So we don't want to get kicked out of the tribe. Chances are you hitting a crappy golf shot is not going to get you kicked out of the tribe, right? And people are worried more about that. I hit a crappy shot and I wonder what they think about me. Right. Um, and, and the thoughts is thoughts that you think are just really your own thoughts because you're saying that to yourself. And is that like a, again, kind of just a, our brains outdated and we're still thinking if we get kicked out, we're going to get eaten. And so that's why we're, we're always trying. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like, yeah, if we're not in the tribe, we're exposed to all the elements. Like we need the tribe to help protect us. So it is when you realize what's happening, um, it's kind of like, you can go, you can start, like I call it negotiating with your brain. Like, okay, brain, I, this is, I'm not in danger here. I'm not going to get kicked out of the tribe. We can calm down. Everything's fine. Right. So um, yes, that's exactly it. It's a prehistoric primal, uh, uh, primal part of our brain that just feels like if that's why we naturally worry about what other people think. And we have some judgment issues because it, when we judge, it helps us make sure that we won't get kicked out of the tribe. Like we don't want to be the outlier for the most part, because that means that, you know, we're not fitting in and we need that protection, but we don't, right. Especially on the golf course. Yeah. It's just so funny how we're still operating from this prehistoric device and still trying to turn it into yes. anything into business and playing good golf. Yeah. It's like this thing is, is uh, still very primitive. And so you got to kind of, that's why the mental game, or I guess we won't call it the mental game. What do you call it then? If it's not the mental game, the, uh, I just call it mental game. golf, you know, cause that's why the people golf. talk about it. But I, you know, I, I think it's golf, it's mental management. It's your, it's managing your mind. Um, mm-hmm. So I just, the game to me, when, when I, the game, that's all we called it was mental game when I was playing for a living. So I felt like it was a game that I didn't know how to play. And it was or a game that I didn't have. And so, or it felt like it was just isolated to golf. So that's why I kind of, I like to separate it out just a little bit and not, and know that it's not a game. It's semantics to me, but I think it's just, it's, it is just about being able to, I like to make it 
more of a of a life thing. It's the one brain thing. And learn how to manage your mind everywhere. And when you can manage your mind everywhere, it just becomes so much easier on the golf course. Yeah, makes so much sense. And obviously, you've played at the highest level, you coach at the highest level. Do you find that there's like one or two defining things that the best of the best do that the like scratch golfer just isn't isn't doing in terms of mental game or mental golf? Um, that a, like a scratch or an advanced golfer is yeah, doing. Say maybe even someone that's like you think is a, is a good AM or maybe you're going to qualify for a USGA event, but then you see the the best of the best players. Is there anything that you're like, man, if they could just adopt XYZ from the pros, it would have a tremendous impact on their game? Um, I think, I think the, the, the biggest thing is the b- believing like believing in themselves, believing in themselves without seeing the results. I think a lot of higher handicappers believe that they can't be confident or they can't uh, feel like they can play the game at a certain level until they see it. And so confidence is one of those things that doesn't come with hitting good golf shots. Confidence doesn't come with having a low handicap or a low score. Confidence comes with the dialogue that you say to yourself in your head about yourself. And that's available to anybody. So I think a lot of people feel like, well, I'm not a good enough golfer to be confident um, is something that gets in their way. And so they got to start believing in themselves before they see that happen. I also think that um, amateurs, and this isn't necessarily mental, but a little bit is they underestimate how much work it that takes mentally and physically to play at a top level. Um, they, they don't realize that, you know, that their one practice session a month or that they just, you know, they should be able to work on, <laughs> you know, be, should be able to think a certain way on the, you know, relative to the game of golf that should get it done and how much work goes into playing at a top level. I think that's something that people misunderstand, but I will say the one thing that is across the board that I coach uh, people on is whether it's your high handicap or a professional golfer is worrying about what other people think, believe it or not, even at the top level of uh, golfers, they worry about what people think managing, um, focusing on results, managing that, like focusing on your score and managing your brain going there and not getting ahead of yourself and pressure, putting pressure on yourself to make putts, whether it's even if you add like a 40 handicapper playing in a, in a scramble for their partners, or whether it's a tour player trying to put pressure on themselves to make birdies. This is like the biggest thing that's like so fascinating to me. I'm like, I need to make some birdies. And, um, and it usually backfires, right? When we try and do that. So those are like the big things that across, it doesn't matter what your handicap is. That's what the human brain does just, um, across the board. Yeah. It's fascinating. You even heard like Max Homa talk about it. Just like, I needed to believe in myself. It's like, how can that, that person that does that good, we watch all the time playing, you know, presidents, Ryder cups, and, and they're still worrying about that. So yeah, it's definitely, it's there for, if it's there for him, it's definitely gonna be there for me and any other yeah. amateur golfer. Yes. Yeah. I have a, I have an academy, uh, that where we just talk about things on a monthly basis, but one of my clients, she's 80 and, uh, and yes, I love her and I had a, awesome. yeah, it's awesome. I have a couple, I have a couple clients in their eighties and I love that, right. They're still trying to work on their game and they're working on their brain and they want to feel better and think better. And I had a tour player on as a guest and she was, and actually I, I take that back. It might've been, I have another client who's like a plus something handicap and he was on the call and he said that he just lost some confidence and she, she was blown away. She said, he's a plus two or plus three handicap. How can he not have confidence? She just assumed that I would instantly have confidence. And once I had a certain number uh, on the scorecard or I had a certain number handicap and it really was hard for her to get her head around. So that confidence is something that we have to work on all the time. Believing in ourselves is something that we have to work on. Even it doesn't matter where we are. It's, it's just relative to where our game is. Um, yeah. And just like you said with Max Homa, right? They're just, it's, we have human brains. It, our brains work against us. Our brains are always trying to tell us how we're effing up and like how everything can go wrong and that how we might get eaten alive by a saber tooth tiger. And if we don't do it deliberately and like think intentionally, it, that little voice wins. Yeah, that's uh, the saber tooth tiger is always, always a good example. Speaking of your coaching too, before we get into the last question, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, how you're helping people, what kind of golfers you help with and, uh, yeah, any other details. 
Yeah. So I help uh, people. I pri- I coach people privately for a one-on-one and um, that's one avenue to work with me. I coach anywhere from 40 handicaps to tour players. The criteria to to um, working with me is if your golf is a big part of your life and you're not happy. Like if you're living in a golf community even, and then you're playing golf every day and you're miserable, that's worth talking about, right? Like I'm managing your mind around that. The other reason is that if you're just getting in your own way, if you know, if you're hitting better shots on the range than you can take out to the golf course and you know, you're not managing your mind very well and golf matters to you, then, you know, that's another reason to, to work with me or to work on this part of your game. Uh, that's one way I have some digital programs where basically what I teach people on privately, I just put into a digital format and people can do it self-paced. And then I have my academy, which is like, I just coach people in a group setting live. They bring questions on and we talk about different topics relative. It's called the Above Par Academy. It's going to change after the first of the year, but it's basically an extension of my podcast. We talk about topics on the podcast and people can come on and ask questions and get coached in more of a group setting. So it's more uh, economical than private coaching. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, it's great to have different offerings. And if you can send me the links, I'll make sure and include them all. Anything uh, for more information yeah. in the show notes when this goes live. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. And yeah, for my last question, uh, we got the off season here for a lot of people. I just had a student who's in New York and he's got four months of no golf. So what is uh, some things we can do for the mental mental side uh, in the off season? Because I feel like everyone's thinking about indoor simulators and doing all this stuff, but I know there's a lot we can do. Do you have any one or maybe one to two exercises you recommend people engage in to uh, help the mindset this off season? Yeah. So I would practice, just like I said, managing your mind. I talked about traffic, like find any scenarios. If if you find that you have something that is a little bit of a red flag for you, whether it's frustration or it might be anxiety or pressure, find different situations where you can practice just deliberately and being intentional about shifting, giving yourself 60 seconds to move into a place of being calm or certain and confident. You don't have to do it necessarily for that scenario. Do it just imagining that you were doing it for the golf course and practice that. The more you do that and the more you see evidence that you can do it and that you can shift, then when you go on the golf course, right, you're going to trust yourself to be able to do that. So I practice on anything. Like I said, you have one brain. So do that as often as you can. The other thing that I would tell people to do is start being aware of the words that you say to yourself on a daily basis. Start paying attention to the negative thoughts that you're saying. Start paying attention to how you treat yourself and you talk about yourself because the words that you say matter. Every single word matters that comes that you hear in your brain. And we get to think, we get to pick, you know, you're going to have crappy thoughts. And I describe it like watching a uh, luggage on a, on a baggage claim, right? You're going to have all these different types of baggage and some you're going to want to pull off and some you're going to want to let go by. That's fine. So you want to be the observer of them and then just be really intentional about the ones that you're going to decide to think about yourself because every, your thoughts create your emotions and how you feel. And really everything that we care about is how we get to feel. So practice listening to and uh, minimizing the negative dialogue in your head so that when you go to the golf course, you're going to have less of that because that's a big thing that affects a lot of people are just like negative Nellies um, out there uh, getting the way. Change your self-talk, change your life. I love it. Yes. Yes. Well, thank sure. you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Uh, anytime you want to do a guest interview, you're always welcome on Wicked Smart Golf. I know you got tons of knowledge up there. and We appreciate you sharing yeah. it all with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. I appreciate it.